So did you know that if it weren't for the fact that God gave us the book of Revelation, we would have to assume that we would actually be led to assume that there's only one rapture and that this single rapture would actually take place pre-wrath and not pre-tribulation. So today I'm going to give you evidence for a pre-wrath rapture and I'm going to be bringing it to you from the passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 15 through 18 and this is the passage that people use as a proof text for a pre-tribulation rapture. So I want you to stay with me in this video because I'm going to show you from the scriptures itself, from the meanings of the words, from how people in the first century would have understood this letter from Paul, what they would have understood it to mean. And I'll show you that it's not exactly the way you've probably been taught that it means, uh, especially if you've been listening to or watching a lot of Bible prophecy that is about a pre-tribulation rapture. So we're going to get into this. It's going to be a deep dive, but I, I hope you'll appreciate um, what I'm about to share with you. Now, a pre-wrath rapture has actually been popularized by um, Marv Rosenthal and other people who have come up with a pre-wrath rapture. And I'm just going to show you what a pre-wrath rapture timeline looks like. It's right here on my board. So they believe that first you have to have the abomination of desolation, and then there's an unknown period of time, and then... There's the sixth and the seventh seal, and sometime before the sixth and the seventh seal is the rapture of believers. Now, pre wrath people believe that there's only one rapture. Okay, so, and this is a huge stumbling block because Revelation actually shows us three, but everybody wants to take all the passages that have anything to do with believers going into heaven and consolidate them into one rapture. And I'm going to show you. Um, from not just 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, but from a couple other places as well, where Jesus taught a pre-wrath rapture, and Paul teaches a pre-wrath rapture, and if it weren't for the book of Revelation, we wouldn't know about the other two raptures that are taking place. So, in Matthew 24, the disciples asked Jesus in the Olivet Discourse, uh, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming? and of the end of the age. Of course, the word used for coming there is parousia. What's the sign that you are about to come as king and be present to rule and reign? And of course, when Jesus begins to rule and reign, that's the end of this present age and the beginning of the kingdom age. So the, the apostles, the disciples were asking the sign of Jesus coming. And Jesus goes on to talk about how there's wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and so on. And the really weird thing is, is people have used those things for signs. And then they say they're not really signs, but they totally ignore the one sign that Jesus gave in Matthew 24. That's the sign of his coming. And that is, it's after the abomination of desolation. You see the, the man, uh, the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. And then you need to flee. And then after the tribulation of those days, okay, which is over here, the sun will go dark and the moon will turn to blood. And that's the sixth seal right here. And then you will see the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And in Revelation 6, talks about this sixth seal event as being uh, the sign of uh, where the heavens are opened and people on earth see Jesus and his father on the throne and they go into their hidey holes. Okay, that's this right here. Jesus' sign is him appearing in heaven. That's the sign of his coming. Okay, so that's the sign that he's about to begin his presence to rule and reign on earth. So the end of the age will be right here. It, within the 42-month reign of the beast, the beginning of the millennial age will start right here, okay? So this is the end of this age and the beginning of the kingdom age. So the sign of his coming will be at the sixth and seventh seal, 
And that is when Jesus is coming. That's his parousia. This is how the first century believers would have understood the word coming. They would have understood it to mean that he is coming to begin his reign. The sign of his coming is right here at the sixth and seventh seal when the Son of Man appears in heaven and everybody sees him. That's when they all go into their hidey holes. Okay, and they they have to be lured out. Okay, that's what the the demons coming out of the mouth of the, the beast, the false prophet. And the, the dragon is all about luring these people out of their hidey holes so that they can battle the Lord at Armageddon. Armageddon is right here at Jesus' second coming at his visible return. Okay, so this is the pre-wrath position. Now, unfortunately, they have two, two things that are in error also, and that is they only believe in one rapture, and they also believe in seven years of tribulation. Something which I've talked about in a lot of my other videos, especially in my series, multiple, multiple videos on Daniel's 70th week. So we know for sure there's three and a half years of great tribulation for the Jews. We know that there's 42 month reign of the beast. We know that the, the remnant of Israel is in the wilderness for 1,260 days. But that is the only time period that we know of, and all of it's after the abomination of desolation. The first three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week can actually quite easily be proven to be Jesus' three and a half year ministry. All of that is in my videos on Daniel's 70th week. So let's go ahead and read the passage that's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is the passage, the rapture passage, that most pre-tribulation teachers and pastors use as a proof text for a pre-tribulation rapture. And again, the big error is in believing there's only one rapture. There's actually three. Revelation is the primary book that tells us about the time of the end. All the details about the time of the end are actually in the book of Revelation and passages like the Olivet Discourse, writings of Paul where it talks about the end are like a confirmation of what we read in the book of Revelation. So let's take a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 14 through 17. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So the, the problem was that, um, that people were worried about the idea that believers who died would somehow be missing out. Paul is reassuring them about the fate or the destiny of the people who had died. That's the whole point, actually, of this passage. And that's the comfort, is that everybody, whether they're dead or whether they're alive, are ultimately all going to be together with the Lord. All right. So, since we believe Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by, the, by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left, until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Okay, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. In other uh, Bible studies, I've talked about how um, Jesus is not going to be bringing with him the spirits of the dead in Christ. That is not a thing in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about the idea that believers are going to be made in the image of the man of heaven, who is Jesus, and that there are people who will get celestial or heavenly bodies, and there are people who will have terrestrial or earthly bodies. As believers, we're going to get a heavenly body. It's being reserved or kept in heaven for us. Our bodies are immortal bodies that are going to be made of stardust are being kept in heaven for us. 
people who are have died and their their spirits have gone to be with the Lord in heaven can get their immortal bodies in heaven because they're being kept in heaven. And people who are on the earth will receive their immortal bodies at the same time the people in heaven receive theirs. So the change from mortal to immortal is in the twinkling of an eye has nothing to do with the rapture of any kind. So I've talked about that in other videos. But here's the phrase that I want to sort of focus in on today, and we're going to exegete this passage. That means we're going to take a look at the passage, and we're going to understand the meaning of the actual Greek words that are used here, how the people in the first century would have understood it, not the way we've been trained to think about it, and we're going to um, look at it from a, a Bible study perspective. And again, if this is uncomfortable for you to watch, you know, just, just let it sit there. You don't have to believe everything the first time you hear it or receive it or anything like that. But I'm giving you the, the, the correct exegesis for the passage. I am not giving you my ideas about what the passage says. I'm telling you the way it reads, okay, and how people in the day would have understood this passage. So we're looking at the, the phrase, we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord. Okay, we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord. And then again in verse 17, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up. Now, I want to take a look at this word left, left until the coming of the Lord. Okay, so this gives you a context of the people who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord. Now, we've already talked about how people in the first century understood the coming of the Lord. They understood it to mean his parousia, that is when he was going to appear to begin to rule and reign. And the sign of his coming is the sixth and seventh seal. And what this passage now seems to say is that there are people who are going to be alive and who are left until this time right here, and that they will be caught up, they will be raptured. Most people, when they think about those who are alive, who are left, contrast this with, okay, so there are people who are dead and have gone to heaven, and then we who are alive who are left. But there's this other little phrase, until the coming of the Lord, which is this, and the actual word for left can mean something other than just people being here. As I've mentioned in other Bible studies, I think one of the very first Bible studies I did on eschatology is for everyone is actually defining the coming of the Lord. The, the word coming is actually the word parousia and it has to do with Christ's personal appearance or the personal appearance of anybody. That, that means they actually show up to do something basically only they can do. According to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the day of the Lord is connected with the coming of the Lord. Let's take a look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting with verse 1. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, and again, the gathering is the gathering that we see in Matthew 24 after Jesus after Jesus comes, we're gathered to him to descend to the earth. We're gathered from the four winds of heaven. Okay, The elect are not gathered from the earth. They're gathered from heaven. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by spirit or spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. And Paul says that day, that is the day of the Lord, will not come unless the departure comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Okay, he's revealed at the time. Um, Paul will begin to describe here. This, he's the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. And of course, that happens at the abomination of desolation. So the day of the Lord is connected with the coming of the Lord. 
right? The coming of the Lord as king will usher in the reign of the king. So in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul is letting us know that there will be a group of believers who are going to be left until the coming of the Lord who are going to be what I call the survivors. These are people, they're Christians, who will not be raptured until the day of the Lord at his parousia, okay, just before the day of the Lord begins, which is right around the time of the sign of his coming, right around the sixth and seventh seals, that's when this group will finally be taken. So what does it mean to be alive and remain, or to be alive and left? Most pre-tribulation Bible teachers really never tell us what that means. They never really exegete that word for left or remain. The assumption seems to be that to be left just simply means that you're alive during the last days. This phrase, we who are alive and who are left, okay, or remain, this little word remain or left is only used twice in the New Testament. And both times it's here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. There are other uh, forms of the root word that are used in other places in the Bible. And we're going to look at one of other word that comes from the same root word. But this actual word to remain or to survive until the coming of the Lord is only used here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So the Greek word for left is a word I'm not going to pronounce. I'll just put it up here on the screen for you. But here's the question. Is it possible that the primary New Testament rapture passage, this one here in 1 Thessalonians 4, that pastors and teachers are using as a proof text for a pre-tribulation rapture is actually referring to a pre-wrath rapture of left behind believers. So I'm going to show you the, the word here. It means I, I leave behind. I pass, I am left behind, I remain, I survive. It's the Greek word that can be used for remnant. That's the other idea behind this word here. And so it just primarily means to be left, to be remaining, and to be a survivor, somebody who makes it all the way to the end. So it would seem that Paul is talking to the Thessalonians about people who survive, who are left behind or there are people who remain. We're talking about Christians because Paul identified himself with this group. We who are alive and remain or alive and are left or survive, they're the ones who will be here until the coming of the Lord. Now, they're the ones who are going to have to obviously endure the reign of the beast, that 42 months. Um, actually, they're going to have to endure some of it, not the whole thing, because we are told in Matthew chapter 24 that the tribulation of those days will be shortened. And for believers who are taken in a rapture, yes, they don't have to be here the full 42 months. So the, the tribulation of those days will be shortened. So these are people who are going to have to be here uh, during the reign of the beast. They're going to have to endure and not all of them will. Some of them will be beheaded. We learn that from the book of Revelation. They won't be able to buy or sell unless they have the mark, and they're not going to take the mark or worship the beast or its image. There are other passages, too, in the Bible that indicate the presence of believers here on earth during the reign of the beast who will need to survive until the coming of the Lord. What are these other passages that describe this group of survivors that will be here. Christians, remember Paul says, we who are alive and remain, or alive and survive, or alive and are left until the coming of the Lord. Okay, so they are believers. They are not um, some kind of weird category that is not considered part of the body of Christ or Christians um, called tribulation saints or whatever. They're actually full-fledged full believers. So there's two other passages that I know of that talk about this group of survivors. The first one is actually in the book of Revelation, and this group is described uh, several times, actually. And the first place that I want to point out this group is in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. 
Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. And some other passages might say the remnant of her seed, the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Now, we know that the woman here is representing the remnant of Israel that is going to flee into the wilderness. So the remnant of her offspring or the remnant of her seed, the rest of her offspring, whatever your Bible says, is not talking about Israel. It's not talking about that group that will flee into the wilderness. It's talking about those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Now, in Revelation, the commandments of God are don't take the mark of the beast, don't worship the image, don't worship the beast. Okay, those are the commandments of God that these people have to keep. And they hold to the testimony of Jesus. In Revelation, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It's the book of Revelation. These people believe what the book of Revelation says about the return of Christ and the coming of Christ and the victory of Christ and so on. So the Greek word that's translated as the rest or the remnant of her offspring can also be translated as left, left behind, the remaining or the remnant. And it comes from the same root word that we saw in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. All right, so here you can see it on the screen. It's the same thing, left, left behind, the remainder, the rest, the others, and it also carries that connotation of being the remnant. So if you have a remnant of offspring, there has to be some group of offspring that came before it, okay? So this is the, the rest of her offspring. The woman has other offspring. She has a firstborn offspring. There's the first and then there is the rest. So the first, her firstborn is in Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. This is the male child, the male child who's going to rule all nations with a rod of iron, who's caught up to God and to his throne. Now we know that believers are going to rule and reign with Christ. This male child, I used to think was Jesus. It was talking about Jesus. But when you actually look at what the passage says, we know that the things that are applying to this male child never applied to Christ, except for the idea that he's going to rule and reign uh, with a rod of iron. And uh, Revelation chapter 2, I think it's in the letter to the church of Thyatira, we read that we're going to do the same thing. Believers are also going to rule with Christ with a rod of iron. So this child is uh, is born, and then it's it's here. The dragon wants to devour the child, but then it's caught up to God and to his throne. So Jesus was never raptured. He was never caught up. He ascended. Jesus ascended into heaven, not, not as a child, but as an adult. And he didn't ascend so that he could escape the dragon or Satan. I mean, Jesus never had to worry about that. There are people who say, well, when Jesus was a baby, that Herod wanted to get him, and so Jesus had to be delivered from that. But Jesus was not caught up into heaven then. He was uh, taken down into Egypt, and Egypt is never used as a picture of, of heaven. It's always a picture of the world. So all of the symbolism breaks down there, except for the idea of a male child who is going to be caught up to God and to his throne. And then we see uh, this this one who rules, these this king, this group of kings and priests, <laughs> are in the throne room of God in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. That's the 24 elders. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But in order for there to be some left, there has to be another group who aren't left, okay? So there's a group that's taken. This is the male child group who's caught up to God and to his throne. And then there is her other offspring. In other words, the male child, this group of firstborn believers, has siblings, okay? Siblings, the other offspring who are left. So... This group, this group of surviving believers who have to endure the reign of the beast until the tribulation of those days is cut short is also depicted for us in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. And here's what Jesus had to say. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and you will be put to death. 
and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Jesus is talking about Christians. It's for his sake that they're delivered up. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Okay, that word saved can be delivered, rescued. And the word um, endure has to do with perseverance. And the end here is the same end that the disciples were asking about. When is What is the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Okay, so here we have the end of the age at the sign of his coming. When sixth and seventh seal, the heavens are opened, Jesus appears there. And those who endure until this time are going to be rescued. They're going to be delivered. So we can see that in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus also talked about this group of believers who would have to endure until the end of the age. And if they survived all of that, they would be rescued. Later on in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus speaks about uh, a group of Christians who are going to survive to the end. And through parables of servants and virgins, he warns them to be watchful. Because no one knows the day or the hour when this age will end. And once this age is over, the day of the Lord or the coming kingdom will begin. So what is the day and hour that we don't know? Well, technically, the coming of the Lord will be. Because that's the question that was being asked in Matthew 24. What's the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Basically, and when are you going to begin the kingdom age? This present age ends and then this age begins. And this is the day and hour nobody knows. Nobody knows this one right here. Okay, nobody knows when that rapture will take place because nobody knows when the day of the Lord is coming. Nobody knows uh, when the coming of the Lord will be exactly, but we do know the window of time. It's after the abomination of desolation, but before the second coming of Christ. So it's not like this um, imminence is like any time throughout history. The day of the Lord and the coming of the Lord will not be until after the abomination, but before his, Jesus' second coming, which is 42 months later, or 1,260 days. And then Jesus go on, goes to talk about the days of Noah and how those days will be like the days of Noah. And we know that during this period of time here, all the fallen angels will be on earth. Satan will be on earth, uh, the, the uh, beast and the false prophet, along with all of the watcher angels who've come out of the pit, along with hybrids and so on and so forth. That's what makes this the days of Noah, okay, because of the existence of all of these fallen creatures on the earth. And because we don't know when this is, this is the thief in the night. Jesus coming will be like a thief in the night. Nobody knows when that is, but we do know the window of time. So Jesus gives parables about the faithful and wise servant. He gives parables about the virgins who need to keep watch. And he talks about this because this group right here does not know when they are going to be taken. They know the window, but they don't know anything more than that. And they need to keep watching for Jesus' return. And the book of Revelation is our primary source, a primary prophetic source for all things prophecy. Revelation will refer us back to many, 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 many Old Testament passages that actually add or flesh out the passages that we read in the book of Revelation. So the first rapture that's going to take place is the a pre-seal rapture, and it's the rapture of the male child who's going to be caught up to God and to his throne, who will rule all nations with a rod of iron. This is the 24 elders. We read about the child being caught up or raptured in Revelation uh, 12, verse uh, 5, and then in Revelation 4 and 5 in particular, we see this group of people um, believers who are in the throne room of heaven. We know there's going to be another group of raptured believers. This is the 144,000 of Israel, 
And in Revelation chapter 14, we see them on Mount Zion with the lamb, and then they follow the lamb wherever he goes. And the next thing you know, you see them in heaven before the throne, uh, before the living creatures and the 24 elders, and they are singing a song nobody can sing but them. And then finally, we have this last group of those who are alive and survive, the survivors, until the coming of the Lord. This is the rest of the woman's offspring, uh, the remnant of her seed, those who must persevere and endure until the coming of the Lord just prior to the day of the Lord, which is what this is right here. And the day of the Lord will actually last a thousand years, and that's why we refer to it as the millennium. So the parables about the ten virgins, the parables about the, the servants who need to keep watching and don't say, my master is delayed and begin beating the, the men servants and the main, uh, maid servants. These, these parables are directed primarily at the believers who have to survive. They have to make it until Jesus comes. And we know it's not just any time. This is not just a any time imminency. This is a time that is in a window of time between the abomination and the second coming of Christ. It's over a 42 month or three and a half year period of time. So there's another place actually in the book of Revelation that talks about Jesus coming on a cloud to take those who are alive and remain or survive until the coming of the Lord. It's found in Revelation. Revelation chapter 14, starting with verse 14, we read about how one like a son of man is seated on a cloud with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now I just want you to compare this to the passage in Thessalonians. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. So Jesus is coming on a cloud, but he's coming on a cloud at this rapture right here of those who are alive and remain or alive and survive to get the rest or the remnant of the woman's offspring, other believers. So if it weren't for Revelation, we wouldn't know that there's more than one rapture. Okay, This is, this is absolutely crucial to understand that you, you have to use Revelation as your primary source. It has to be your primary source for, for the end time timeline and the end time story and about all the different groups who are going to be brought into heaven, different groups of believers who are actually depicted as sons. Now, we know there's going to be another group of believers who are going to be taken into heaven before the hour of trial, and that is uh, not, not the pre-seal group, the man-child, but the 144,000 of Israel who will be taken before the hour of trial. The hour of trial is right here on the same day as the abomination of desolation. It's that hour, day, month, and year when a third of mankind is killed. It's uh, the sixth trumpet, okay? It's the sixth trumpet event. And remember, the seals have their own timeline, the trumpets have their own timeline, and the bowls have their own timeline. You don't have to have all the seals and then all the trumpets and then all the bowls. That's, that's not really how this works. Um, okay, so here's where... I'm, I'm just going to say it the way I, I think it. And you're obviously, you can think whatever you want. Um, you can believe whatever you want. This is, this is my thinking. This is how I'm seeing it. But I'm seeing it from an exegetical perspective and from a historical perspective, how people in the first century would have understood this, not um, how we've changed the meaning of words so that we can get the kind of eschatology that we want to see. So the first thing I just want you to understand is that if you don't define the words properly, you're going to end up with bad eschatology. And it's just that simple. If you define the word uh, coming, Jesus coming, or his parousia, and you take it to mean a rapture, uh, you're going to end up with bad eschatology. 
the coming of the Lord has to do with when he, his presence, when he's going to arrive to usher in the kingdom age. The rapture can happen around the coming of the Lord, but the rapture is when people are taken into heaven. They mean two different things. The rapture, harpazo, is one thing. The coming of the Lord, the parousia, is something else. And do not confuse them or conflate them. The day of the Lord is often construed to be a reference to a another, what I call it a false doctrine. It, it's really bad, but it's the foundation of just about every eschatology out there. And it's called a seven-year tribulation. Okay, it, it does not exist. The seven-year tribulation is not a thing. You cannot find it in Paul's writings. You cannot find it in the book of Revelation. It's not a thing. It does not exist. There is tribulation. There's persecution for sure. There is a 70th week of Daniel, but there is nothing within the text of Daniel 9.27 that leads us to believe that we're looking at seven years of tribulation, persecution, and wrath. It just isn't there. And like I said earlier, I believe that the uh, first half of Daniel's 70th week was fulfilled at Jesus' first coming when he put an end to sacrifice and offering. And then the abomination of desolation will take place sometime after we're gone. So here's something else that doesn't exist beside a seven-year tribulation, and that's the rapture of the church. Okay, What we've seen here is that Paul has included himself in we who are alive and survive until the coming of the Lord will be caught up. This means we're talking about believers here, but we, we know that there's at least two groups of believers. This is the remnant group, and there's another group, the male child, who's already been caught up. We know there's at least two raptures, at least two. And so if we're talking about the rapture of the church, we understand that it's going to be divided up into at least two. And actually the 144,000 are another group of this larger entity called the church. There is no single rapture of the church. Another um Bad eschatology is that the bride is raptured. There, there is no bride. Uh, there is no bride in Revelation until after the end of the millennium. <laughs> That's when the bride and the marriage supper and all of that takes place. And here's the deal. Though the day of the Lord begins with wrath, okay, there's going to be uh, the great day of their wrath has come, okay, sixth and seventh seal, Bowl judgments and all of that are going to take place over here. The day of the Lord begins with darkness and not light. Even though that's the case, the whole day of the Lord, the whole millennium is not wrath. And the day of the Lord is not a seven-year tribulation. The day of the Lord is the kingdom age. It's the, the great day. It's the thousand-year millennium. So anybody who equates or conflates the day of the Lord with a seven-year tribulation is also in error. There is nothing in Scripture that um, brings those two ideas together. And we know that the wedding banquet is not the destination of raptured saints. We're going into the throne room. We're going to be praying. We're going to be interceding. We're going to be doing a lot of things, but we're not doing the marriage supper of the Lamb. The marriage supper of the Lamb isn't until Revelation chapter 22, when the Spirit and the bride say, come at the time of the new heavens and the new earth. So believers will be engaging in prayer and worship, intercession, and even an instruction of other people in God's throne room and the wedding supper will not take place until after the millennium. There is a wedding supper in Revelation. There is a bride, but it's not until the very end. So basically what we have here is a lot of poor exegesis. We have denominational echo chambers where people, a group of people who believe the same thing, keep saying the same thing. And if you want to say something different, you're kicked out. Okay, You can't be a part of the tribe. So there's a lot of unexamined eschatologies out there and a lot of traditions of men that lie at the heart of these errors. And I'm not saying that these people are bad. I'm not saying they're wicked or evil or anything like that. I'm not saying they're demonic or satanic. What I'm saying is that a lot of the things that we believe are uh, contrived, they're, con they're constructs, they're 
what other people have read into the text rather than taking the text and just letting it say what it says. A lot of people are uncomfortable with letting the text say what it says because sometimes it kind of leaves you hanging and you, and you don't know where you fit. But if you are willing to just let it be and let God lead you in these things, you're going to find the truth. You're going to find a larger and fuller explanation for these things. So I don't have any degrees in theology but you don't need any, okay? If you have the Holy Spirit, you have a Bible, and especially in this day and age when you can go online and see what the original meaning and understanding of some of these Greek words are, um, really, you don't have to have a, a doctorate or any kind of fancy degrees. You can just be a regular Christian, a regular Christian person. And the thing is, is that God loves to work with unlearned people. And so he can even take housewives from Idaho and show them things that, you know, other people who are far more trained and have, um, you know, a lot more credentials totally miss. And the reason they miss is because of tradition. It's because there is a, a kind of an agenda that they have in their mind of how this should work. And so we're going to make it work. We're going to make the scriptures say those things, whether they actually say them or not. For me, this just highlights how wonderful it is that God has given us the book of Revelation. And it in this book, this testimony, uh, this pro prophetic testimony of Jesus, so many of the holes and the gaps and the um, the questions that we have about what is going on during the end times, they're, they're all filled in in this book. And because it's written symbolically and there's so many references to other passages in the Bible, so many other themes of scripture, themes of the firstborn, themes of the tree of life, even themes of the fallen angels, the, uh, the, the hybrids, the days of Noah, all of this is added to the book of Revelation, making Revelation one of the most expansive, um, amazing, mind-blowing books in the whole of Scripture. It's sort of like God took everything prior to that and he crammed it into this one, one little book that if you understand what the symbols are, what they mean, all of a sudden you've got this gigantic picture of the plan and purposes of God. So let me know what you think in the comment section below, and we'll see you on another video. Till then, have a blessed day. <music>